uh, Chandra was my master's student and uh, Arthur Bush is a colleague from my mathematics department and uh, Fyodor Dragon is my colleague from state of Ohio. <coughs> uh, which one do you click on this? All right, so uh, so distance scale matching is uh, <coughs> is basically a, a set of edges. Uh, it's a matching with uh, uh, some some constraint on it. So if you look at any two edges uh, in the set, the distance between them must be at least k. So by that I mean if you look at pairwise uh, distances between the vertices on the edges, uh, the minimum should be at least k. So. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, published work on induced matching, which can be thought of as distance to matching. So induced matching is a matching that is also an induced subgraph. So IM of G is the uh, size of the largest uh, induced matching in, in G. So here's a, a tree, and, and uh, so the red edges uh, is an induced matching because it, it is an induced subgraph. So it's a 2K2 in this case. Um, so the maximum distance K matching problem is, um, I think I'm better off here. All right. Uh, so given G and K, you want to compute the largest distance K matching, and this is hard uh, even for induced matching. So finding a largest induced matching or finding the largest distance to matching is hard. Uh, so, so for people like us, like me at least, uh, you want to ask what if I know more about the graphs, can you solve it uh, efficiently? So what if you know, uh, what if you have a restricted class of graphs, can the problem be solved efficiently? And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, several results of the type that are published, and I didn't mean to list all of them, I just listed some relevant ones uh, for the talk. So for example, if you know that the graph is quarter, uh, you can find uh, largest distance to matching or largest induced matching in polynomial time. Uh, same for like circular arc graphs, uh, weakly coordinate graphs, uh, asteroid and triple field graphs, polygon circle graphs, and so on and so forth. Um, so several people have already defined these uh, graph classes, but let me quickly go through these. Uh, so graph is quarter if uh, any cycle that can have a chord must have a chord. So every cycle on at least four vertices has a chord. Uh, weekly chordal is a more general class of graphs than a chordal. So in a weekly chordal graph, we don't have any induced cycles on five or more vertices in the graph as well as in the complement. So it is uh, closed with respect to complementation. So clearly every chordal graph is a weekly chordal graph, but it is a much more general uh, class of graphs. So uh, here is another class uh, I want to talk about. So the dually quadral graphs. And uh, unlike quadral and weekly quadral, this is a class that is not hereditary. And it's usually defined uh, using hypergraphs. So graph is dually quadral provided if you look at the clique hypergraph, it's a hypertree. So by clique hypergraph, I mean the vertices are vertices of the graph. And the hyper edges are maximal cliques of the original graph. And the hypertree is uh, means to uh, so the hypergraph is a hypertree means you have a, a tree on the vertices of the hypergraph so that uh, every hyper edge uh, induces a subtree. Uh, so uh, there are lots of uh, equivalent formulations of what a dually quadral graph is. There are nice characterizations, and so uh, one consequence is if you have a dually quadral graph then the intersection graph of the maximum uh, cliques of the graph must be quadral, or in other words, that's basically the line graph of the uh, clique hypergraph. And conversely, if you take a quadral graph, and if you construct the intersection graph of maximum cliques of the graph, that must be dually quadral. So that's, a, that's why they named it dually quadral. So it's dual to quadral in lots of senses. And uh, another way to uh, think of dually quadral graphs is these are exactly the uh, intersection graph of uh, maximum cliques of quadral graphs. So that's another way to state these. So, um, so here is the relationship among these graph classes. So by IAT I mean interval graphs. So dually quadral graphs and weekly quadral graphs overlap in that way, and every quadral graph is a weekly quadral graph. So graphs that are both dually quadral and quadral, uh, they are they are named DBC here. They are called doubly quadral. And then you can see that uh, so interval graphs are all in there. 
these are strongly coded graphs. They are all in there, so it's a generalization of strongly coded graphs and doubly coded graphs. And in fact, strongly coded graphs are those purely coded graphs that are hereditary. So that's exactly what you get. Um, so uh, uh, earlier result of uh, time limits, uh, implies that uh, if the graph is coded, then the maximum distance to matching can be solved in polynomial time. And recently there was a paper by Bramstead and Moscow where they show that if the graph is coded uh, for all uh, even uh, parameter of the distance, uh, the problem is in P, but maximum distance three matching is hard. So, so we can generalize this to uh, a more general weakly coded graph. So if you have a weakly coded graph, uh, then the maximum distance 2k matching is in polynomial time uh, for every k at least one. Uh, whereas for every odd value at least three, the, the uh, corresponding problem is uh, NP hard. So that, that generalizes what they did. Um, and for dual coded graphs, it behaves the other way. So if you have a dually coded graph, sorry, for dually coded graph, the, for every odd value at least three, the, the problem is in, in polynomial, polynomial is solvable, but the, the even cases are NPR. So as a corollary for doubly coded graphs, for every value of k at least two, the problem is solvable in polynomial time because you get the even cases from the uh, coded case and you get the odd cases from the one above. and. Uh, so there's a result of branch in Moscow, which, which says that uh, if you have a strongly coded graph, for every k at least two, uh, the problem is solvable in polynomial time, and doubly coded graphs are more general than strongly coded graphs, so it generalizes that also. And I want to say a bit about the, uh, the induced matching problem, or the maximum distance to matching problem. And there's a general auxiliary construction that is used in this, as well as some of the other ones I talked about. And that is to construct this graph, uh, which is called G star in the literature. So you start with the graph that you want to work with, and you construct this graph G star. The vertices of G star are edges of the original graph. And if you pick any two uh, vertices here, uh, they are not adjacent if and only if they induce a 2K2 in the original graph. So here's the graph on the left, and here's the corresponding G star. The vertices are the edges in there. And uh, for example, if you look at edges 3 and 5, they don't induce a 2K2, so they are adjacent here. Whereas uh, 1 and 6 do form a 2K2, so uh, they are not adjacent here. And then it's clear that uh, if you pick an induced matching in there, that should go to an independent set here and vice versa. So this graph G star is actually, so it's another way to uh, talk about the square of the line graph of G. So it's basically the square of line graph of G an induced matching at G is an independent set in G star and vice versa. So if you can solve independent set in the derived graph, you can solve the uh, distance to matching problem in the original graph. And this is the way some of these were obtained. So for example, Cameron proved that if the graph is chordal, G star is chordal. We proved later that if you have a weakly chordal graph, then this G star is weakly chordal, and then it gives you those. Uh, there are algorithms to find independent sets in those classes, so you get these results. So uh, that sort of approach gives this sort of a complexity. So for quarter graphs, it will give you a, a square of m. m is the number of edges, uh, time algorithm, and for weekly quarter, m to the third. And of course, this, if you construct this g star, it, it would have m vertices, and it could have omega of m squared edges. So uh, that's going to be a bottleneck in the, in the process. So the question is, uh, is there a way to get around the bottleneck? And there are some other results of this type, but here is one that, that's nice. So, for example, Branstad and Huang showed that a largest induced matching in a quarter graph can be found in linear time. Uh, so, they obviously do not construct this G star, so the algorithm does not construct G star. But you don't know that the G star must be quarter if G is quarter. So, what they want to do is they want to solve the independent set problem on G star without constructing G star. So since G star is a chordal graph, you would like to have a perfect elimination scheme of G star without constructing G star. And that's basically what they do. So they start with uh, a lexicographic depth first search ordering R uh, of the graph. 
uh, which is basically the output generated by the lexicographic breadth first search algorithm, which is guaranteed to be a perfect elimination scheme for a codal graph. From that, they will construct a linear type, an LBF as ordering of G star. And then once you have the ordering of G star and G, then you want to simulate finding the largest independent set in here using that order in the graph itself, and you want to do that in linear time, uh, and, and, and thus uh, avoiding construction of G star. And uh, so we sort of wanted to look at it for the larger class, which seemed natural. So we have order graphs, so you can solve the problem in linear time, the, the distance to matching problem. And for weekly quarter, you have that. And there's a class of graphs in the middle that's well looked at, called HHD free graphs. Um, so what are HHD free graphs? So you don't have any of holes, namely induced cycles on five or more vertices, and then you don't have any of the so-called houses, or the complement of an induced path on five vertices, and you don't have the specific graph, domino, which is start with a induced cycle on six vertices and add a chord uh, keeping it bipartite. So you don't have any of these. Um, so if you want to solve, if you want to use similar approaches, then you better, better hope that a G star in this case has some special properties, and indeed it does. So if you have a graph that is HHD free, then this G star is also HHD free. And uh, why, should, why should this help? Well, these HHD free graphs are well looked at, and they have lots of nice uh, properties. So when you have a graph that is HHD free, the graph as well as the complement are perfectly orderable. So by G, G prime I mean uh, complement. I, I don't know how to put the bar on the top of PowerPoint. But, um, and and uh, perfectly orderable basically means there exists an orderly, a perfect order of the vertices using which if you greedily color the graph, you are guaranteed to get uh, an optimal coloring. Um, so from the previous theorem, that would mean that G star as well as the complement of G star are also perfectly orderable. But uh, in general, finding the perfect order is hard, but in this case, you actually can. So it is known that if you take a perfect, uh, sorry, HHT free graph, and you produce an ordering that comes from the lexicographic breadth first search, it is guaranteed to be a perfect order of the complement of a graph. And uh, thirdly, if I give you a, a uh, a graph, and if I give you a perfect order of the complement, then we can find the largest independent set in time that is linear in the size of the graph. So, uh, but what we want to do is we want to work with the, the star graph. So my graph is <coughs> HHD free, but I want to solve the independent set problem on the G star, which means I want the perfect order of the complement of the G star. Uh, so that would that would happen if you go from an LBF as ordering of here to an LBF as ordering of here. So it sort of makes sense to play this game. Uh, before I go, there, so um, a corollary of what I just said at the other theorem is that you already have an M square time algorithm to solve the problem on HHT free graphs if you construct this G star. Because once I construct G star, I know I have a perfectly orderable graph. So if I run LBFs, I get a perfect order of the complement, and it's just the problem of uh, uh, if you use the algorithm on perfectly orderable graph to get what you want. So the question is, uh, is it possible to get the perfect order of the complement of G star when you're looking at G when the graph is HHD free? And then second step is, if you can do that, can you find the largest independent in G star only by looking at C? So uh, that's actually a nice story, but unfortunately we can't quite do that. Uh, natural ways of trying to construct the LBF as ordering of the complement of G star, sorry, LBF as ordering of G star from an LBF as ordering of G, uh, they do not work. In particular, what uh, Brownstead and Huang used in, in their approach to quarter graphs, that doesn't work. Uh, but we can do something, so we can do something more general than quarter graphs. So if you have an HHT free graph, and then if you forbid those two specific graphs, then starting with an LBF as ordering of G, uh, we can find an LB was ordering of G star in linear time. And using that for that class of graphs, we can solve the maximum distance to matching uh, problem in linear time. And this is still a more general class than quarter graphs, so it pushes uh, what th those did uh, uh, to some extent. And uh, finally, uh, the abstract mentioned min max relations, so I want to say a bit about it. Uh, so I want to take some old results and recast them in a particular way so that they all fit in. 
uh, in the mold of what I want to say. Uh, so already uh, chain subgraphs and some of the other things have been defined, but let me just go through it quickly. So if you have a bipartite graph, uh, a G, you can talk about a chain subgraph of it. So it's a subgraph uh, that doesn't have any two gate. Right, so in this case, uh, here's a bipartite graph. The the green edges form a uh, chain graph because there is no 2k2, but the red edges as a subgraph uh, has a 2k2, so that is not <coughs> chain graph. And uh, so, given a bipartite graph, one can ask about the minimum number of chain subgraphs that you need to cover all the edges of G. Uh, so, Alan Tappers and his original paper on partial order dimension problem proved that. Uh, computing the minimum number of chain subgraphs needed to cover a bipartite graph is uh, NP hard. So there's, a, uh, there's an obvious inequality going on with the size of the largest induced matching. So uh, if you pick any two edges in the induced matching, they have to go to different chain subgraphs. So the chain cover number is at least as large as the uh, size of the induced matching. But uh, there's an old paper where uh, basically you can inter interpret the result to say that these two parameters can be arbitrarily different for, for bipartite graphs. So it makes sense to ask uh, when would they be equal, uh, what about classes and so on and so forth. Uh, this, this has been studied and uh, this sort of uh, hierarchy was talked about in an earlier talk. So there's a whole bunch of uh, classes of bipartite graphs that are well looked at. Uh, so bipartite permutation, biconvex, convex, here, here one circle or whatever oval is contained in the other means the class is properly contained in the other one. Uh, so for example convex bipartite graphs, so what are convex bipartite graphs? It's a bipartite graph uh, where you can order the vertices of uh, one color class so that if you pick any vertex in the other color class the neighbors are consecutive in the ordering. So there's a result of you channel ma that if you have a bipartite graph that is convex, then uh, these two parameters are equal. The size of the largest induced matching equals the minimum number of chain subgraphs needed to cover all the vertices, uh, sorry, all the edges, and then you can find that cover uh, in square, uh, m squared time. And so we have this uh, result here that you can do it in n squared time. So for, for convex uh, bipartite graphs, uh, you have equality. And it's a much larger uh, class of graphs that was also talked about earlier in a couple of talks. There are the bipartite graphs. So these are bipartite graphs where you don't have any induced cycles on six or more vertices. Another way to say uh, talk about these is these are precisely bipartite graphs that are also weakly codal. Uh, uh, so, so again, the connection to gamma free ordering was mentioned earlier. So we proved. Uh, uh, in 2008 that if you have a quadral bipartite graph, in fact, the size of the largest induced matching must equal the minimum number of chain subgraphs needed to cover all the edges of the, the graph. So that's, that works for more general, uh, general class of graphs and you can find the cover in a polynomial type. Um, there is a, an old result of cameras which you can interpret in this way, where it basically says that if you have a quadral graph, then the size of a largest induced matching must equal the fewest number of split subgraphs, in other words, subgraphs that happen to be split graphs that are needed to cover all the edges. And you can find the cover in polynomial time. So between this result and the previous ones, there is obviously a common theme because a chain graph is the complement of a quadral graph. The split graph is also the complement of a, is complement of a quadral graph. And so those are the objects used to cover, and the quadral bipartite graphs are weakly quadral. Quadral graphs are also weakly quadral, so there's a there's a natural generalization here, and that turns out to be true. So we can show that if you have a weakly quadral graph, then the size of a largest induced matching must equal the fewest number of co-quadral subgraphs. But then it means subgraph, which you if you interpret as a as a graph happens to be the complement of a quadral graph. And so the size of the smallest covered with co quadral subgraph equals size of the largest induced matching and, and you can find that in polynomial type. Right? And since the weekly quadral graphs are closed under complementation, if you interpret it in the complement, that basically says that uh, the uh, 
uh, minimum number of chordal graphs whose edge intersection is the given weekly chordal graph can be found in paranormal time and I suppose that the general problem is already known to be hard but uh, uh, I'm not sure but I'm pretty sure it's hard. Uh, so finally uh, there is a similar min max relation we can show for dual chordal graphs. So again for dual chordal graphs the uh, distance k matching problem is uh, solvable in polynomial time. If k is odd and at least 3, it's hard. If k is even and at least 2. So, a little definition. So, a distance k vertex covered <coughs> is a set of vertices in the graph so that if you pick any edge in the graph, there is some vertex in the uh, set that is uh, within distance k of the edge. So, in other words, if you take k to be 0, you get the uh, standard vertex cover. So, what we can show is for every k at least 1, if you have a graph that is weakly chordal, then the size of the largest distance twice k plus 1 matching must equal the size of the smallest distance k vertex cover in the graph. And uh, uh, you can find that in a polynomial time. And I think I should. Stop here. Since it's the last time, I don't want to keep you forever. So. <laughs>